Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to today's online seminar. Uh, I'm Lee Hopwood, the CEO here at the CCMA. And you may be aware that we've been running a hybrid working series all summer to support contact centre leaders as you develop your new working approach. Um, we are, um, uh, we've got a couple more coming up, uh, which uh, you're welcome to go onto our website and go and check them out. But today we are looking at mental health and wellbeing. And as much as two months ago, we thought that the challenge of hybrid working might be solved for September. Um, people going back to school and maybe we'll all back to normal. And it has become really apparent that, that maybe it's going to be months and months before a new way of working really finds its feet and, and things start to settle down. So in the meantime, um, I'm hearing members talk about a lot of testing, listening to, to colleagues and, and experiencing some of the changes that people are going through. In, in how they think um, working from home or in the office is the balance starting to tip from a desire to work from home to wanting to work in the office um, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and the hybrid working series has been taking lots of different specific challenges and really giving you a chance to have a deep dive into them in some of our interactive sessions and also in, in just sharing some insights um, this is an interactive session and um, the challenge that we are going to be uh, tackling is the same mental health and well-being. And it has been a really key priority over the last 18 months. Um, and so hopefully today is going to give you some new advice, some new insights um, and some, some new ideas to take back into your operation. And to help us unpick this and look at where we are today, I've invited Abigail Hirschman, who is a mental health and well-being expert, who is the director of workplace programs at the Charlie Waller Trust. Um, and Abigail, you've also been the workplace wellbeing expert for the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence and also at ACAS. So you've, you've got a wealth of experience behind you to support us today. Yes, yes. Thanks, Lee. Hello, everybody. Um, shall, I, uh, shall I start now, Lee? Is that OK? To go yeah, please it? do. Okay. Please do. And, and um, once so we're going to hear from from Abigail um, and she's going to share some of that advice and tips and some of that insight. Um, and, and then I'm going to introduce Steve Mosser, who is the Group CEO and Chief Innovations Officer at Sonse. Um, but I shall introduce him fully in a moment. Over to you, Abigail. Thank you. It's, it's lovely to be here. And yes, I have been. I Previously, I was Head of Health and Wellbeing for ACAS, and I now work for a charity leading their health and wellbeing, mental health and wellbeing programmes. But all of this has been informed by my early career as a psychotherapist and a psychologist. So I've worked with people who have been unwell due to mental or psychological difficulties. And now I work with workplaces to see what they can do to help support people who, um, you know, who may be unwell or may just need a little, who are struggling a little bit. So what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to share a couple of slides with you just to give you some wider context and then hopefully we'll invite some uh, Q&A once we've heard from Steve and you know be able to answer some of the challenges you may be having. So I will just share these with you. Okay so um, Straight on to, to, this is an approach that uh, we've adopted at the Charlie Waller Trust, but it's also built on the work that I did at ACAS. So whilst you may be in a management position, people who are on this call or supervisors or maybe employees, essentially managing mental health and well-being at work is the most is, is done the most successfully and the most effectively when everybody plays a part and what has been seen in the pandemic is how much it's accelerated understanding of mental health but most importantly how more senior members of organizations have this on their agenda so the way we position it at the trust but as i said regardless of, of you know what we say this is evidence-based it's about employers leading developing strategies managers understanding how to have conversations and develop the skills and confidence and in some ways we're sort of born knowing how to do this because we're born you know we're human and we can speak to people who may not be feeling quite themselves but when we're put in a management position it can sometimes feel a bit more challenging because of the additional performance questions alongside it as individuals all of us in the workplace um, have a responsibility to look after our own mental health and well-being so becoming aware of our own stresses is really important and then what's really become um, evident through the pandemic is the 
impact of teams and how that lateral support so whether you're a manager and it's with your other management colleagues or whether you're you know uh, somebody sitting on a, on a contact center it's how you connect with your colleagues and how that extra support can be offered not just from the top down but across to each other in our teams so um, the stats have, have, are pretty much similar. Um, there's been some increases in mental health and, uh, concerns and some, some have stayed the same, but essentially stress, depression, anxiety cost businesses. There is, um, it's the longest cause, it's the biggest cause of long-term um, long sickness absence. And uh, the key, pressure, key causes, workload pressures haven't really changed, lack of managerial support. And this isn't because managers don't want to do anything or don't want to help. Often managers don't have the capacity necessarily to support colleagues. So it's about understanding as a manager where your boundaries are, are what you need to be able to help support colleagues. Um, in terms of actual depression, there has been an increase. Um, it's more than doubled since before the pandemic. But in terms of the long term impacts of those, we're still yet to see how that will play out. And in the workplace, people may have depression or anxiety, but actually more likely they might have low mood or they might feel worried or stressed. So it's about understanding that not everything is about mental illness. It's about some of those you know, day to day challenges that we all have and how we can respond to those in a workplace setting. And then, as you may be aware, there are certain groups have been um, more directly affected by mental health and well-being. So in a workplace, if you decide you want to do something, it's about thinking which are the groups that we need to pay the largest attention to at the moment and whether we want to focus our resources on that group before we move on to the general population. This is some research that came out uh, from the ONS and it was picked up by the BBC. Um, so it's just the, some of the causes behind why people might feel unwell. Mental ill health is a consequence of other features. It may be a consequence of feeling lonely. It may be a consequence of having excessive work demands. But the mental ill health will be um, often it's a slow burn to when somebody becomes unwell. But these are some of the reasons that people have said they haven't been feeling, you know, great over the last period over the last 18 months or so so lee talked about the, the hybrid challenges that we're having and it's very interesting um, how workplaces are thinking about this but it does look like most large organizations are not planning on bringing people back to the office full time um, significant percentage of workers would like a hybrid working model so this is that mix between some in office working and some at home working and um, firms as i said are expected to continue with that type of model but i think it's absolutely true to say that everybody is slightly struggling and thinking what, what do we need to do not struggling in a bad way but just trying to manage all those different challenges that might arise so when we talk about challenges at work um i just want to touch on this briefly we we do a lot of training at the charlie Waller trust and you're welcome to contact me about that afterwards but it's about how you spot those signs mental health essentially it's about how we think and how we feel and how we behave. In the old days when we had people in front of us, sometimes it was easier to spot those signs, but now we communicate by phone, by text and by uh, screen. So how can we spot those signs? Particularly when people, we use the iceberg metaphor a lot in mental health and wellbeing. So what we see on the surface is only one small proportion of what's going on underneath. So somebody might say, oh, I'm, 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 I'm not really very good at this piece of work. But actually what's going on underneath might be a long term concerns about their performance, about the fact that they may be they're in an insecure job. So what you hear up top is, is different to what's going on underneath. But you're not supposed to be psychologists or counsellors or medical professionals. It's about picking up those signs. I sometimes think about a bit sort of being Sherlock Holmes really at work. So it's just picking up those different signs that you might see that might indicate someone is struggling. This all of these things work on the premise that you already have existing relationships with the people you work with that are just about developing interactions that mean people are more likely to respond to you if you do express concern with them. But there are a range of ways you might see that somebody is maybe not feeling themselves. And in order to sort of, as I said, that platform for managing well-being well, the you know managing a difficult conversation with somebody about their depression depressive illness is quite a rare occurrence and that happens that's sort of like the z of management but the abc of management is about these different um, elements you can put in place in order to make sure that you provide the platform so that people feel able to um, talk to you and you feel confident as a manager to express those concerns with somebody 
We at the Charlie Waller Trust, as I said, we've done lots, we do lots of training on this at all different levels, and we've developed a framework called the BEGIN framework, which just sets out the different touch points along that way that managers can have those more delicate conversations. And it's very much a collaborative approach. It's about asking the employee what they do to keep themselves well, as well as what um, you can do to help them as a manager, what the wider organisation can do as well. It doesn't all sit with the manager. And in that way, there were different um, routes that you can do. So if you're a large organization, you'll have different expertise within the organization, which um, I put on here, you have employee voice, you know, it's really important. One of the key watchwords in anything you do at the workplace is around consultation and communication and finding out from people what they need and what they want, either in terms of whether they want to go out, you know, what sort of online social event they want to be part of, or whether it's about finding about what type of support they would like. And then it's using those different providers. There's free resources out there. The government provides support for organisations don't have, um, you know, in-house expertise. And working with your occupational health um, to understand what the impacts of that person's concerns are on their ability to do their job. So the key messages here, which will probably be reinforced throughout the Q&A, is about taking a preventative approach, responding as soon as you can when you notice somebody may not be quite themselves, um, having line managers who are trained, colleagues and teams, as I said, that lateral approach, make sure your support services that you have are relevant to the staff needs in front of you, and that your uh, these products and services are, are relevant and take up is routinely monitored. Often organisations put something nice and shiny in and nobody wants it, nobody asks for it, nobody uses it. So make sure that what you do put in place is something that people find valuable. So as I said, we have a uh, we have a workplace program, and you're welcome to contact me. But we also <laughs> gladly receive donations for the work that we uh, that we do. But um, yeah, just to say that this is very much about the work we do about improving mental health and well-being at work. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Abigail, and thank you for sharing those slides. I think there's some some really good tips in there. And um, um, please do, if you've got questions for Abigail, please do use the Q and A. Uh, on the platform um, and we'll uh, be posing those questions to, to Abigail shortly. But managing colleague health, uh, health and wellbeing in the office is one thing. Um, supporting colleagues when they're at home and out of sight is another. And um, so we've asked Steve Mosser, who is the Group CEO and Chief Innovations Officer at Sonse, um, please do join us on screen, um, Steve. And, and, and Steve, you're going to share with us how you, you support colleagues at home and the technology that you're using. Um, so I, I, I'm going to hand over to you, Steve, because you're going to give us a little bit of a view of the technology you use. So you're going to demonstrate um, what you do, but um, you've also taken some of uh, the things that Abigail has been talking about and addressed them exactly how you're dealing with, with, with the challenges that you, you guys face. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Lee, um, and thanks for having me. Um, and us here. So uh, indeed, uh, as you as you said, um, I I founded Sensei uh, many many moons ago, um, and we were uh, the first pure play, uh, hundred percent at home staff. And what we meant to do over the years is, and since our inception, was to ensure these first four points here that you see here. We're actually using right now uh, the live desk. Um, and um, what what we what we absolutely wanted, since our people were recruited remote, remotely, trained remotely, managed remotely, is we absolutely wanted to make sure that no one was ever uh, alone, i.e., aka lone working. For that, we need to ensure that there was certainty and continu continuity of support and care. The second part is that we absolutely wanted to embrace uh, the creation of digital communities and, and, and as I'll show you, the digital workplaces. So that with whether they were in the work or to socialize, uh, all our people, wherever they may be, had the means to communicate and to, to some extent overshare and over communicate because that's often the key to resolving some of the um, uh, uh, challenges from a mental um, well-being uh, side of things. The third, the third aspect was that we wanted people to not be at a disadvantage compared to their office counterparts. And I'm gonna share with you in a minute um, uh, what we mean by that. 
And the fourth and probably the most important for the for our people at home was to ensure that we minimized or eliminated altogether what we call work source of anxiety for people that work from home is they alone know what are the life constraints, demands, uh, whether it's pets, children, the mailman, and therefore um, imposing shifts uh, as per the standard working and resource planning um, practices inside bricks and mortar workplaces just wouldn't work because you have to take these things into account. So for that, what we did is that we created a number of systems, uh, but ultimately to let give people the freedom to choose when they work and build the work around their lives. Um, as I said, I, um, I uh, wanted to share with, with you, um, as part of our engagements on with our outsourcing arm, we constantly engage with a number of businesses from every vertical and of every size. And as part of our engagement exercise, we uh, basically map out what we call their line management processes, which fall under these categories here, and their life management processes uh, that fall under uh, these categories. And what we do is we rate their effectiveness. And in blue, this is what you see in blue here, though that's their effectiveness from zero to five of said processes inside the, the physical workplace in bricks and mortar. So as you can see, there's a few that, uh, that rate well, some that don't. Uh, floor walking is one of, the, one of those. Um, and then since the pandemic, since um, everybody's been forced into a work from home or home working um, uh, uh, position um, and had to uh, improvise home working solutions, um, we've also rated how they, those same processes, how they're being performed for the people that work from home. And, uh, and as you can see, unfortunately, despite best intentions, there's quite a strong variance. And I'll bring back to the, 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 the first point I, I, uh, I, I, I made, which was that it's incredibly important for uh, your people and of all workplaces to never feel like second class citizens. So, um, which is a language I use quite often. And our goal was to ensure that first and foremost, our people were there to augment uh, a workforce that was employed by our clients inside a physical workplace. And we wanted to ensure that as far as work performance is concerned, they were they had zero disadvantage. So they were on an equal operating foot um, and that they were they had the access to the same information, uh, support and care as the people inside the workplace. Now, this extends obviously um, to um, to uh, duty of care um, and well-being for our people, of course. So we created um, a number of technologies. Um, the live desk, actually, we're in the live desk right now. Level the level the operating field um, and make sure that we don't miss a beat in terms of um, the wellness of our people and how they may be feeling at any given time. If they have if they need information uh, to help a customer that it's always there and that actually the virtual floor walkers that are supporting people in a live desk are the same people um, that are supporting the physical workplace. All right, so actually live desk is for everyone it's not just for home workers it's for everybody in the hybrid workplace. And all our clients have embraced the tool because it enables to unify all the people on the same work mission. So think like, for example, an insurance in the claims department, everybody in claims, whether in the office or at home, would be connected to the same live desk. And what the live desk enables uh, our, our, our clients and our people um, is that it empowers them to have all the channels they need to communicate with their, um, with their peers, uh, with their line managers, and basically augments tools like, you know, for example, like Teams or Zoom that we're using right now or Google Meet. Um, so that basically creates what we call a macro collaborative um, uh, toolkit. And uh, for the staffing, the work-life collision, i.e. choosing your, when you work, the system we create for that is Team Tonic. 
And essentially what happened, the clients just post by half hour, so by 30 minute increments, what um, they need from uh, the workforce. And then our people self-schedule to that. And the system self-balances itself. But one of the key measures that we've done in that is scheduling satisfaction. So we actually measure work-life collision um, and the satisfaction of our people in terms of scheduling at home. And the same applies to for all home workers across uh, across uh, our client base. Um, in in in, in, in the live desk, we have, you can see here on the right hand side, this mood meter, it's currently empty because this is a demo one, but ultimately what enables us to do is, um, is to track uh, well-being um, and engagement across um, all users, again, wherever they may be, whether they're at home or in the office. Um, and the way that's performed is a diagram of a red smiley face to super green of um, descriptors uh, that says, I'm, for example, I'm upset, I've had a bad call, I want to speak with a manager. And when they, if they click that, that goes into what we call a pick me up, uh, which will notify all the managers. Here's, here's an individual in, in the workforce that has an issue. It will be it will appear and it will notify um, the line the line managers and more than one because again the whole uh, I'll go back to this certainty and continuity of support. If my line manager is not online when I have I face I face an issue, I still need to speak to somebody. And if there's if there's nobody, if I'm relying on just typical line management structures and logic then there's a high probability that actually I'm in, I'm in need of care, I need to be picked up and there's nobody here to do so. So the system here, Live Desk regulates that and, and ensures that no matter what happens, if you're feeling down, you will be supported. Um, and just to finish, I, I just wanted to use um, the um, the chart that uh, Abigail shared earlier on uh, around the ONS of some of the challenges that come that happen, and how what we decided to do, and 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 what we felt we had to do as an organization to ensure that people again is ensure that you have no matter if it's out of hours. You always need somebody um, there to take care if somebody has uh, needs some 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 support. Um, feeling like a burden that often stems out of well, I I have a need, but I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to escalate these issues. And it's ensuring, as Abigail said earlier on, is that top to bottom, um, everybody has a stance on mental illness and duty of care and an approach that needs to be industrialized. And we're all equal people, and we're all equal as citizens. Um, in in the in this digital workplace, strain on relationship again. It's about minimizing work life collision, imposing shifts to your people at home is made frictions and ultimately will lead to to HR uh, getting needing needing to get involved. Uh, too much time alone. Um, uh, I'm, I'll take that aside is we with the live desk and by creating these digital communities and communication channels in our work time uh, there's people are never feeling alone and uh, again is I encourage uh, over sharing over communication rather than under communication in your digital communities and your hybrid workplaces uh, feeling bored um, I don't know in the contact centers, uh, you know, we, we operate with this micro scheduling principle. Our people are always busy. Boredom is actually a really, really bad enemy um, in, uh, for, for home workers. So um, really encourage that uh, for your people that work from home, that you apply a different workforce planning um, philosophy and approach uh, that ensures that they stay busy and again, that they have more freedom of choosing when to work so they can build around their lives. Worried about the future? Well, I think you know, obviously this is a, a, everybody has been with the pandemic, um, but again, having a dynamic community beyond the work that includes social things so people can communicate even they're stuck at home for, um, is very important because then they can share um, and and whether it's their worries or their their um, their their ambitions or their dreams. So and 
feeling stressed, oh, sorry. Um, obviously, work-life balance um, is, is critical uh, to uh, relieving stress. Uh, juggling childcare with work, again, I'll talk about it's around the freedom of choosing your hours um, so that you don't have um, these, this work-life collision. Um, and finally, um, um, uh, increase in workload. Uh, in terms of the frontline and contact center agents, uh, I, I think it's, you know, everybody, every business is different. Um, but one of the key things that, again, that needs to be holistically understood, and, and I really encourage uh, to, 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 for you to, um, is really understanding that, when, particularly for your homeworkers, is understanding the boundaries between work and life and encouraging your people to have a secluded space to work with their families or their partners to understand if this door is closed if i'm working then there's no dis no disruptions please and and really creating a, a space where work starts at one time it finishes at one time uh, it starts on another and finishes at another um i'll finish just on this statement is you know, a long time ago when we started the business, the number one management misconception with home working would be that people uh, don't work enough and are not productive. The actual number one problem was people were overworked and actually were anxious because they felt they always needed to be able to, to, their managers always needed to be able to get in touch with them. So there's, that's quite a divide. Um, and, um what you know we've always taken that approach and said okay well what what standing of the uh, issue the challenges of well-being and um there needs to be a top-down um training uh, across the people but also there needs to be processes and finally systems to tackle these on an industrialized basis so things are consistent across your organizations departments etc cetera, etc cetera. Thank you, Steve. And apologies for any technical um, uh, uh, hitches that uh, went uh, that, that people might have experienced there. But Steve, we did we did hear everything you said. Um, sometimes a little slower, but uh, we did hear everything. Um, thank you, Stephen. And um, thank you for the questions that have started to come in. Please do use the Q and A, and I will come to those questions. But but Steve, I want to um, just come back to you because. Sansei is a business that has really grown throughout the pandemic. And, and that is partly because your business model, as you say, has always been to work from home. And um, from your experience, therefore, are you seeing mental health and well-being um, as much as a priority now as it always has been? Is it as much as a priority now as it was a year ago? That's a tough question. Um, I, I... I think the nature of how we approach, as I say, since the, our humble beginnings was, you know, it was at the core for us. Um, have, you know, if, if, if I, I can speak about the, the results of, you know, as I say, we track engagement and well-being actively and dynamically in the business. And um, yes, there, there have been some, some particular challenges that have cropped up throughout the pandemic. Um, from a people point of view, but that's really, it would probably fall in the category of being worried about the future. Yeah, and I think that that um, leads me on to a question that I want to come to, to you, Abigail. And has the nature of mental health challenges and, and what's been going on, has it changed? Are you, are you seeing a, a difference now, again, to maybe a year, 18 months ago before the pandemic? Is, is the nature of those change, of those concerns changed? Um, the nature of the concerns have changed slightly, I would say, but I think in terms of mental health and well-being, it, the messages and the interventions have pretty much stayed the same over the last, as I said, 15, 20 years. But the nature, the context within which we work is absolutely crucial to how people think, feel and behave as in how their mental health is affected. So um, Steve just talked about worried about the, the future. So that essentially is the concern because of the context within which we are at the moment or which we were previously, as in mass redundancies were highlighted and, and those sorts of concerns. So those things people were worried about the future as well as physical health. And then the consequence might have been high levels of anxiety. 
So that tends to be how it's played out in terms of our, the way we work now. I mean, I remember years ago, I worked with a contact centre and I remember being in with them and there was chaos and there was cam camaraderie and there was connections and there was lots of lots going on, lots of energy that was going on. So that energy creates well-being. It helps support people when there's a stressful customer. It helps, you know, when you can go out and have a cup of tea with somebody. So there was things in that environment that were still the same. So you still got difficult customers on the line, but you had mitigating factors around you. So when we think about has it changed? Well, yes, if you are then taking those difficult customers and those difficult calls from your spare bedroom, or maybe not even from your spare bedroom, from your living room or from your kitchen table, that's going to have a greater impact on your well-being now there are payoffs that you may be able to take your children to school or do something or not have your commute but well social connections are a key driver of well-being so we have to find a way in this hybrid model to 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 balance those two out the needs of the employee to maybe have a better sort of you know less commuting time but equally those social connections that really help us with our well-being Thank you, Abigail. And, and I think that's where um, I was alluding to right at the top of the um, of the session was was I wonder if that tipping point is is starting to go. But I'm going to go to the questions that are coming in. Um, I know that I have got a set of questions that I'd love to ask you, but I am going to go to the questions that are coming in. Um, and Steve, I'm going to come to you first because I think this one is uh, more pertinent to you. So it's from Sean. Um, I have a question regarding video calls. Personally, I am not a huge fan of being on video. However, as a people manager, I feel it is important to see my people and to pick up on any nonverbal cues as to their well-being. Where is that balance between seeing my people and not forcing them to do something they may feel uncomfortable to do? Or is it a culture thing that needs to be embedded? Steve, what's your response to that? uh it's a really good question and finding that balance is can be difficult but it, it, it's it's a bit of both it is cultural um and creating a, a number of i guess rules and etiquette um what we do internally is that uh we always start and the greetings and the goodbyes are always on video and what happens in between we allow people to to turn on video if they want but the beginning and the end must be of that. If it's a one to one, then absolutely video is critical, as you say, to pick up the visual clues um, to ensure that people are not in a state of disarray, that they're not in the kitchen or, you know, in, in our world, we, you know, as to be to be a, a sensei home agent, you have to have a secluded space. Again, part of these boundaries things. Um, so we want to make sure that the, the place of work inside the home stays the same, that it's health and safety compliant. They're not, you know, working on the edge of a stairway or anything like that. So visual clues are extremely important uh, from a duty of care perspective. And again, ensuring that your people are well and they're in a in a, um, not only a viable uh, workplace in their home, but um, they're in a safe place. Yeah, I think that's a good shout. And and I'm going to um, come back to what you said there um, from a cultural perspective. And um, Abigail, I'm going to ask um, you one of the other questions that's come in, um, because it is looking at that cultural piece. How do you get organisations to change their way of thinking when it comes to mental health? I find even though it is very much in the forefront of people's minds these days, companies are still quite old fashioned. And it is it and it, it is still quite a taboo subject in some cases. Abigail, what's been your experience? How do you respond to that? Yeah, I think that's uh, that is still absolutely the case. So just because there's a lot of talk about it doesn't mean there's a lot of action about it. Um, just to go on, just to the Sean's comment, I, I at the early days of the pandemic, I had lots of employers talking about the video thing. And I remember reading somewhere that people put post-it notes in front of their camera, in front of it, so they couldn't see themselves on the screen. So I think there's there's techniques you can use. And also nobody eyeballs each other all day long. You know, it's it's quite an unnatural way to I might be looking like this, I might be looking like that. And if I was in a meeting with you, you wouldn't notice that so much. But when you're sitting seeing me on a screen, so it's just so I think telephone actually as well. I understand Steve's point absolutely and I agree with it. But I also think using the telephone is actually quite a useful mechanism, particularly when somebody's mentally feeling mentally you know is struggling. You know, we don't you, you they always say with teenagers, you know, the car journey is the best time to talk to a teenager because you're not staring at them. What's the matter? What's the matter? So it's just using different mechanisms. That, that's what I want to say, which in a way comes into the point that, that was made just now. Essentially, um, having mental health as something that gets talked about at work is a due, there's a multi 
a factorial way of doing that. So having that basic management relationship with somebody helps to develop rapport. So rapport, you know, you meet somebody, you get to know them, it develops rapport, it develops connection, it then enables support to be more likely. But that's on a one-to-one -one basis. In an organisation, you often find mental health sort of sits with that lovely lady in accounts who's become a mental health first aider. But it's about having a much more cultural approach to it. Now that can be through um, comms and it can be through highlighting it on particular mental health and wellbeing days. It can be through mentoring support services, so where you um, align people with each other in the organisation. So talking about how people, not how people feel in sort of, I'm you know, in terms of an introspective perspective, but just how people are finding work, how people are finding their lives, how people are finding things going on. All of those things create a culture about we're talking about how you are becomes commonplace. Organisations that are doing this really well use a range of informal and formal mechanisms to do it. And another another organisation I was working with last week, which I thought was really good, they what they did, they did some videos and they got people in the organisation, senior members of staff and junior members of staff to talk to each other about what they've done at the weekend, about what they do when they're feeling a little bit, you know, tricky. So there are lots of different ways we can do this, but all of these will help uh, break down those cultural taboos. Thank you. And, and um, Abigail, on your slides, um, you uh, mentioned line managers are trained, and this is one of the questions that's come in. But I'm actually going to ask Steve the question. Um, Steve, are all your managers trained in mental health awareness, well-being, and how to support their, their colleagues? And, and, and maybe there's other things that they're trained on specifically around this topic. So yes, they all have, uh, I mean, I just for the sake of simplicity, have what we, you could term basic training, um, but on how to pick up clues and all that, but then we have uh, experts. So basically um, it, there's escalation points depending on the severity of the case. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and I guess that's, that's the point is that actually, yes, it's, it should be part of management training whether you are working from home in the office or whatever your your working model is it's it's part of being a, a manager but as, as abigail says it's it's sometimes z rather than abc so abigail i'm going to come to you next um, with a question from julie um, we are now seeing agents who say they are unwell so can't come into the office but could log on from home which also could be a concern how should we discourage presenteeism, presenteeism? Yeah. You know, Julie, I think you've actually asked the question that has been constantly uh, challenged, you know, raised over the last six or so months when organisations are trying to manage the hybrid model. So people aren't coming into the office because they're not well or they don't feel well enough, but they're able to work from home. Sometimes that's actually about that person not wanting to make that change and shift into the office. Sometimes it is literally because they're unwell. So the Again, with anything that, that we would do, we would recommend in this space, whether somebody's working from home or not, what is their, what, what's, what's wrong with them? You know, what is the ill health, whether that's physical or mental? What is the thing that's concerning them? What aspects, does that mean that they can't do their job at all? And if they're too ill to do their job, then they need to not log on. And it's a manager's duty of care to ensure that people don't work when they're unwell. But it may be that there are certain aspects of their job that they can do um, from home still. So if they've got a cold or a cough, they probably don't want to travel, they don't want to increase levels of viral load when they're out, but they can still maybe do their job when they're, they're, they're logging on. So it's, it's, but it's really understanding is the, the reluctance to come in because they don't want to come into the office, because for a lot of people that shift back into the office is causing quite a lot of anxiety and concern, or is it actually that they're genuinely unwell and if they're unwell then no they shouldn't be working as a manager you have to make sure that that those parameters are put in place for them not to be able to work thank you and um i sorry i am bouncing between the two of you and it um and, and partly on purpose partly not but um i'm actually going to take the next question which i think leads in from what you've just been talking about there abigail and and steve ask um i'm going to pose this comment to you and see what how, how you're feeling on this um, so the comment is, we are currently struggling at the minute with volumes of calls and sickness. We have been asked to pull one-to-ones and team briefs, and surely this is just going to add to the extra pre pressure. And I agree, it feels like that's yeah. just going to make things worse. Steve, so, have, have, you, have you felt that, seen that, done that? So look, I'll, I'll tell a funny story, but well, I'm not going to take the whole story, it'll take too long. But anyway, 
That is absolutely forbidden. And when we engage with our clients, we say you are not allowed to pull one to ones and team meetings, whatever happens, but particularly one to ones. OK, As for, for your home workers, 100 percent for sure. It's it's a critical touch point. Um, and and taking that away from people, what we've seen is that and the reason we established that was obviously we we, we learned from our mistakes, but, uh, you know, about I guess about 10 years ago, uh, it was a client was going through a difficult time, a lot of volume, not enough people, too much sickness, whatever. Um, and so they pulled a one to ones. And what we saw is we saw attrition just go through the roof. Um, because it didn't last a week, it lasted a period of four or five weeks. And, and uh, basically, uh, it just people were like, you know what, I can't do this. You know, I need that touch point, it's critical to my well being. Um, and so I would say really insist because it, you will make the problem worse if you if you let uh, the organization the operation do that out of the present need you're going to create a, a, a longer thank you steve sorry we were just having a couple of technical issues there um abigail you i saw you make a note there did you want to add to that yeah, I think it's really, I think it's really important what Steve said. Sometimes when things are taken away at ACAS, I would often see this with collective conciliations when, you know, they change terms and conditions and they never came, they never come back on stream. So once you start to take something away, you know, it, it can be lost. As a manager, I would recommend that they do a quick and dirty risk assessment with something like that. So they can really look at it from a sort of a practical, rational perspective. You know, if we take away this, this is going to be the consequences of this and uh, therefore they've got some evidence in front of them why they don't agree that this is a good idea and then the other thing is is to go to the team sometimes going to your team and saying to them look this is what we've got high volume of course i don't want to add to your pressure one of the recommendations is that we reduce one-to-ones and team what would you find the most beneficial for us to manage this challenge over the next three months but as i said putting those parameters in like steve said is so important so that it doesn't suddenly become lost amongst the higher demands and then managers see oh they can do more calls now we don't need those anymore but we you absolutely have to have those uh, relationship opportunities and and one of the things that we've talked about is um flexible working we've we've touched on that um you both touched on that at, at various points over the last 45 minutes and um and it does seem to be a positive thing to support um, health and well-being. But um, when we talked about it, but we've, we've talked about work-life collision and, and that maybe flexible working can support and stop that work-life collision. And um, Steve, you mentioned it, but Abigail, please, can you explore that a little bit more around um, and maybe share some of your advice around how you can really stop that, that collision happening? Yeah, it used to be called work-life balance and it became work-life merge and now it's work-life collision, you know, because things are, our worlds have collided. So this is why this collective responsibility is so important. Flexible working helps people feel autonomous, you know, it creates greater employee autonomy. Employee autonomy is, is perfect, it's brilliant for well-being. So it's a no-brainer in terms of the benefits of flexible working, but it's about those boundaries and it's about how those the individual puts in place those boundaries between their work life and their home life, whether that's a physical distancing in the way that they actually are physically situated, whether it's about taking a walk around the block that, that duplicates their commute, or when you come back from holiday, I think, again, employers I'm seeing that are really thinking about this more sort of intelligently and holistically, one employer was talking about how when people come back from holiday, because essentially your holiday may have been that you, you know, you stayed at home. In the old days, you go on holiday, you think, I don't really want to go back to work on Monday. But by the time you'd commuted and you'd spoken to the guy on reception who you had a laugh with, coming back, you're sort of re recalibrated coming back to work. So this employer was looking at how people then who came back from work could, again, recalibrate back to the workplace rather than just moving from one room to the next. So flexible working is a brilliant um, model. Um, remote working is not flexible working, it's just one aspect of that and organisations I think are getting uh, some of these a bit confused. Flexible working is a whole host of different interventions. All of it helps increase increasing autonomy but the boundaries and as a manager checking those boundaries with your staff 
that's your right that's your responsibility this is why managed training is so important so you have the confidence to be able to ask that person about what they're doing to keep themselves well i'm noticing that you're logging on at you know ridiculous o'clock what's going on those sorts of things you know go hand in hand with that opportunity for flexible working and it's interesting we've um, also touched on the role of the manager and um and, and what they they should be looking out for steve if i can come to you the um one We've heard through the research we've done, we've heard it on discussions before, that the role of the team leader um, within a contact centre that's office based has changed massively. Um, for you, you're probably thinking, well, actually, that's the they're the kind of role, that's the role and the kind of skills that we look for anyway. What are the kind of um, skills that you look for in a team manager when you are operating in a, in a home working or hybrid model? uh first and foremost experience in working from home yourself um we found it extremely difficult uh to recruit from scratch somebody that hadn't started in the front line so typically um people are promoted over the years and and um because it, it is a completely different management mindset to virtually manage a team than it is a, a physical team again, with all these visual clues and all that. It's, it's, it got easier over the years because obviously we, we start to understand what, what is the DNA of a great team leader and manager uh, for a hundred percent at home workforce. But, yeah. you know, it's, uh, as I said, it, it, it took a lot of trial and error, unfortunately. <laughs> so. But there, there is just, uh, just there are some, uh, obviously there are some great training out there, um, uh, some of which we offer, but uh, others do uh, as well. Um, and there are psychometrics that can help you uh, understand what is that psychological DNA. I, I, I used to talk a lot about is what we call tolerance to ambiguity. Um, and it's, it's extremely important um, in terms of a, uh, for a team leader to un to understand and be tolerant to ambiguity um, when dealing with home workers. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And 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 that kind of falls into a the vulnerable um, colleague um, term, I guess, in some respects. That that has been um, that is being increasingly used. We talk a lot about vulnerable customers, um, especially in our special interest groups here at the CCMA. Um, but what about vulnerable colleagues and vulnerability in the workplace? Um, Abigail, can you talk to us a little bit more around that concept and how um, and how contact centre leaders can really address that? Yeah, I think it's a really, really good question. As I said, a lot of focus has been on the vulnerable customers and rightly so, but actually on the vulnerable uh, colleagues is really you know, crucial to think about. And a term that's become really highlighted over the last 18 months has been about psychological safety. So it's about creating a workplace. And this goes back to that early question about talking about mental health. You uh, Talking about mental health happens in a psychologically safe environment. And a psychologically safe environment is where people feel able to highlight difficulties challenges without being derided without being um you know called out for them so that's not necessarily about their mental health that may be about an idea raising your hands and going do you know what should we try this and without the manager going that was ridiculous we tried that last week it didn't work or you know are the extreme workplace bullying so creating that psychologically safe environment in the first instance is absolutely crucial banter is great banter is important in a workplace but it's keeping it in balance and keeping it measured and so by having that in the first place it means that people are more likely to express their vulnerability they're going to feel less likely that they're going to be challenged or they're not going to be listened to so you have to create those parameters first that people feel they can be vulnerable and that's why keeping those one-to-ones that safe space for somebody to say something or for the manager to raise it. the manager needs to feel safe as well to be able to raise it that's why you have to, uh, yeah, keep keep protected time so that that person can have opportunities to be vulnerable. Yes, interesting. And um, I'm going to come to the um, to I'm going to say the last question that's in the Q and A. Um, and Steve, I'm going to come to you first. What are the main mistakes that we are seeing organisations make as they try to enter the home working hybrid field? What are you seeing organisations doing that you think mm, I wouldn't do that? So. Uh, the number one mistake is 
trying to apply what you're doing in bricks and mortar physical space and trying to adapt it for home working. Um, so what we encourage businesses to do and you know what we do every time uh, with our clients on the outsourcing front is um, is basically go back to the drawing board. But what what what's critical again is the consistency of what you do for your workers, whether they're at home, uh, in the office or back and forth is that they have uh, the same approach no matter where they work from uh, and that applies to line in life processes so this consistency is key um, and obviously um, it's uh, it's easier just to start afresh and say okay how do we create a new process what do we need to do from a people point of view and systems point of view so that whether i'm at home or in the office I, I, the, it's the same approach and therefore I'm, I'm measuring and doing the same thing. Yeah, no, good shout. And, and Steve, I'm gonna um, stay with you and just switch it up again for the last few minutes. Um, we've started to hear more about the digital workplace. Um, and so that doesn't matter where you work, you have access to the same communications processes and resources um, that people have come to expect in the office, um, at home, um, possibly if they go to a third space, is that the future of work? Is that where you see um, things being in three, five years time? Yeah, I mean, it's just an extension of the previous question, actually, is, you know, yeah. again, is, you know, I, I talked about second class citizens, you know, people need to have access to the, the same information. So they and, and the same support, you know, if even if floor walking is a great example. You know, if I'm the people in the office just need to raise their hand, somebody comes over and gives them the answer and then up, I go back to my customer and my customer's happy and I get a, you know, super KPIs. But the people at home, they're trying to struggle through teams to find somebody to give them the answer and say, oh, you know what, forget it, I'll just give the wrong answer to my customer. Then it's just not, it's not, not going to be a, good outcomes for anybody. So it's absolutely about creating a hub. And, you know, there's various means are, are not catered for that, you know, whether it's intranets and all that, but it's people supporting people and having this immediacy, this certainty and continuity of support is really critical. And that can only be achieved by creating these digital hubs or digital workplaces. Thank you, Steve. And, um, and Abigail, and Steve, I'm gonna come back to you in a minute um, for you to share your, your top piece of advice to support uh, mental health and wellbeing in, in a hybrid model. Um, but Abigail, um, I'm going to extend that further conversation around digital workspaces. Are these digital workspaces, do you think that they are going to look after mental health and well-being in the workforce? Oh, that's a, that's a challenging question. You know, there's no coincidence, Lee, that actually uh, social connections, people, you know, reduces pain. You know, we, we have a part of our brain lights up when we connect socially with people. You know, chronic illnesses are mitigated by us keeping connected and, you know, involved with people. So whilst I think digital workspaces have got a brilliant opportunity, the reach you'll have had today will be far greater than if you had this as a physical environment, you know. Mm -hmm. There are lots of fantastic opportunities for digital workspaces, but there, I think businesses who don't have some physical connecting opportunities for people, whether that's once a month or once a week or whatever it is, I think uh, they are going to lose out on terms of learning and development, on terms of anecdotal learning, on terms of keeping people physically well and healthy. So I think there are, um, there are massive benefits to a digital workspace and having an infrastructure for that, as Steve's talked about, but I think, uh, people need people. People need to see, smell, yeah. and feel people, not in an inappropriate way. But you know, you need to have that because that's actually what we've. That's what's helped to survive as a species. Thank you, Abigail. And I am going to come back to you in a moment for your um, number one piece of advice or your top three pieces of advice um, on on this very subject. So, Steve, what's your advice uh, on? maintaining uh, optimizing well on on managing mental health and uh, well-being and, and enabling um a really healthy um approach to to this in a hybrid model so, um, I, i'll go back to one of the points abigail made which i thought was really pertinent which is the the accepting vulnerability and diversity and you know we all have we all need to have equal voices and that may be cultural and we all aim to do it but whether we're doing it or not is a different thing 
But we absolutely, as I say, for us, it's about all being equal citizens. It doesn't matter what job title, where I am, where I am. We all have equal voices. And I think it's for me, it starts with that. And then it's obviously that that we're all attentive listeners. Again, whoever I am, um, that I'm I so I can spot that there's distress or um, a something that is an emerging issue. Uh, that may be affecting a, an individual or a team. It, it, sometimes it can be an entire organization, um, but there, there's always symptoms. And it's, you know, and again, I'll go back to Abigail's point is it's really important to have training and awareness on all this so that basically we're equipped with detecting. Um, and then thirdly is having, uh, and I, I, I hate the word industrialized because it sounds robotic. And for me, digital workplaces are not about automation. It's still human to human. Um, but that there is there is really a systematic um, means in processes and systems to escalate and, and mitigate uh, the challenges, whether it's at the individual or community level. Thank you, Steve. And Abigail, what's your final piece of advice? Um, I think mental health is not a thing. We made mental health into a thing, and I think we need to debunk it and de demiss you know, take away the mythology of it. Mental health essentially is how I think, feel and behave and how you think, feel and behave. The humanity that we have, we need to bring that back into the workplace. The more we create this as a thing, the more we think it's something that, it, that needs to be done to, and it doesn't. So this is why management training, yes, training mental health management, but training just the basics about how you have a conversation with somebody and how you understand somebody and how you put in a reasonable adjustment, all of those features around it to help that person feel more confident. Anything that creates social connection is going to improve well-being, it's going to improve um, mental health, and it's going to impact productivity and performance. Yeah. Essentially, feeling engaged. So I sort of have a consult as much as you can, communicate, be consistent with your messages, be clear because people's brains are already overloaded, and care, you know, just care for people. And bringing those features together, as I said, stops making mental health a thing that we need to do, but it just brings it back to the fact that we're all human and we all work together and we want to be engaged with a similar goal. Thank Which you, sounds Abigail. Really fluffy, but it's not meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And um, and hopefully we can share your slides um, that, yes. that you shared earlier and, and that, that would be great. Um, Abigail, thank you for joining us today. Um, Steve and the team at Sonsei, thank you so much for, for joining us, sharing your story. Um, and, and supporting today as well. Really, really appreciate that. And we have got more hybrid working series events coming up. Um, next week, we're talking about res resource planning in hybrid working. Um, and also on the 30th of September, we have our Q3 member seminar where we're going to be, um, we've got a panel debate where we're gonna be finding out where people are at. Um, you know, how, how much progress have we made? Is, is you know, what learnings have, have we had so far? Um, as well as uh, we've got Kate from Peninsula, who will be there um, ready to ask your questions from an HR perspective, um, and in particular looking at recruitment and attrition in hybrid models. So there's more coming up, and there's so much more that's going on, on um, from CCMA. So please do check out our website, ccma.org.uk, and um, hopefully we'll see you all at an event soon. So Abigail, Steve, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for joining Pleasure. us. And we shall see you all soon.